Welcome to worship at McFarland. It's great to connect with you on this uh, day of the Lord, together with all the great staff and pastors and leadership and all the saints of light as we gather for worship as McFarland Church. We welcome you, our guests, and everyone. As you uh, enter into worship today, please let us know you're worshiping with us by going to the link in the chat box or by, go to, by going to our website, mcfarlandunc.org, and uh, click on the online worship button, and there you'll find a way to let us know. Also, on our front page of the website, you can find the red button and tap or click there, and uh, sub submit to us your prayer concerns, your joys, your celebrations, so that we can be in prayer with you. We love to do that. We do pray for you, and we want to uh, hear from you. So help us with that. And then um, as we move along through um, this month and this year, we have so much planned uh, as the church together. And today, our senior, pa senior associate pastor, Wendy Neal, uh, is going to share some about our life and ministry together. I'm so happy to be worshiping with you today and to proclaim with you that this indeed is the day that the Lord has made. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today we celebrate all that God is doing in and through us at McFarland, and we're going to hear a special message about our focus this year as a family of faith, of how we are growing together as God's authentic community. We're also going to continue our sermon series called Soul Reset, and I truly believe that you will experience the power of God's Spirit during this time of worship. We come to worship today from different places, perhaps in our homes right here in Norman, perhaps outside on a walk, or perhaps we're joining from somewhere around the world. Take a moment just to think about all of the people who are joining with you in worship right now. That wherever you are, you are not worshiping alone. Our prayers, our singing, our words are lifted up as one voice because we are God's people together. And so we begin this time of worship singing our praises and giving our thanks to this amazing God who keeps us all connected. <laughs> written a fresh affirmation of faith that we plan to use uh, today and in the weeks ahead as we complete our journey through this pandemic disruption. I hope that you'll find it encouraging for your heart and your life, and we'll find it encouraging for the heart and life of our church together. I hope that when we say it together, you will stand in solidarity with us and with each other, with people all around who are part of this great church and our great mission to change lives that change the world. And so we'll be 
in engaging in that in just a moment and invite you to uh, give it your heart. Thank you. McFarland, though the pandemic disrupts and hurts, let us affirm our confidence in God together. God is with us, and we are filled with hope by the power of the Spirit. We are in this together. We engage faithfully in worship, discipleship, and mission. We pray, share, and care for each and all who suffer. We seek God's wisdom, listen to medical leaders, act, and sacrifice to keep people safe. We pray, plan, and work both now and for the future. We are together for the day when we all gather again. We follow Jesus faithfully. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. We together. Oh, holy God, we give you so much thanks for this new day and this new opportunity to connect with you and to hear your voice once again. Oh, God, as the light shines into our physical spaces today, we are reminded of how Christ's light shines in our lives and time. God, we feel your warmth and your nearness and your glow and we draw from your energy, and we begin to see the world around us in a new light, in the light of your love. Oh God, as we dream about the kind of community you call us to be, the kind of community we can be, help us to walk bravely in this light, in your light, this week and in the year to come. May our ears be ready to listen. May our eyes be willing to see May our hearts be softened to your will. May our actions be in step with our Christian beliefs. May we walk the talk. May we keep no secrets, no, not hide anything away, especially not the light that you now place within our hearts. God, help us too to reach out in the light of love to others, to those who still walk in darkness to those who live in the shadows of poverty and injustice, and to those who need help to see your way. God, light up our life, that we may shine like stars in brilliance, in wonder, but most of all in love. And God, we pray all of this in the name of Christ our Lord, who is our light and our salvation. And we pray together the prayer that he taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In our scriptures, we hear this bold declaration. If we walk in the light in the same way that God is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. 
An amplified translation puts it this way, if we all live together in the light of God, just as God certainly lives in the light and indeed is the light, then we experience the bright joy of authentic community centered in the forgiveness and freedom that we find in Jesus. Hearing the voice of the Spirit in that scripture text, we were led to designate this year as the year of authentic community living in the light of God. Walking in the light means to live honestly and transparently, not hiding anything. We walk in God's light, not our own light, so that we can experience both the warmth, grace, and embrace of the one who saves us all, and the kindness, love, and togetherness of one another. Walking with God has a direct effect on our relationships with others. Loving each other genuinely has a direct impact on our own relationship with God. When we walk in God's light, we see more clearly and understand one another more deeply. We create a place where we model what it means to wrestle in an open and in an honest way with topics that divide us. We practice active listening and we allow God's love to reconcile us to one another. We create a place where above all we are centered on the good news of God's love in Jesus Christ and recognize that God is doing something transformative in and among us. This year-long emphasis is designed to strengthen and preserve unity, to enrich and deepen our love, and to enable common pursuit of the mission to change lives that change the world for the next 100 years. This year, we will continue to be challenged by the pandemic and its effects. We may also be challenged by decisions made at a scheduled general conference of the worldwide United Methodist Church with regard to the church's stance on issues having to do with human sexuality. McFarlane, we are both a church united in Christ and a diverse church where many different expressions of common values are present. Learning to talk openly as members of the body of Christ is vital to living a healthy life together. In order to have healthy, crucial conversations, we must be authentic and vulnerable with one another. We have to embrace the tension rather than avoiding it and forge our future together living in the light of God. Trudy Sickles is one of our two elected lay leaders for 2021, and she is a longtime and faithful member of McFarland, and she is here to talk about the year of authentic community. McFarland, you are my beloved community of faith. You and I are woven together in the fabric of this historic church and with our contemporary mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ to bring about the transformation of the world. While I do believe that we are an authentic community in Christ, I also do believe that we have room to grow in our ability to love each other and to worship and work together while all around us there may be division, debate, and strife. I have no doubt that you join me in both desire and commitment to see our great church meet any and all challenges and to walk strongly into the future, living in the light of God. I ask you to join me and many others in this year's crucial emphasis by engaging often and intentionally in worship, in mission action options, in discipleship learning and spiritual formation, and in various opportunities that invite us 
to become an even more authentic community living in the light of God. Over the next 11 months, we will have many opportunities to experience and to learn just what it means to actively live and practice authentic community. We are busy praying and planning our preaching, teaching and caring, our worship, music and discipleship, and our mission and community building engagements for people of all ages for our great church. So watch our website for information, watch your mail, email, and the notifications on our McFarland app so that you'll know how you might participate and invite others to participate as well. You know, we need each other. God has called us together for God's great mission to redeem and transform the world. Let's do it. Let's do it together. Let's engage in authentic community as followers of Jesus Christ, living in the light of God. Amen. McFarland, in the four short weeks I have been here, I have already felt and experienced walking in the light of our living God through this authentic community. And I'm so excited for the year that we have in front of us to continue deepening and growing our authentic community. And so I invite you to consider prayerfully how you might continue to support our authentic community. Um, there are many ways that you can, you can give. Down in the comments is a link. You can go to our website or our app to give, or you can even mail in your offering to continue supporting this authentic community for a world that is searching for God's love and grace through the people of McFarland United Methodist Church. Would you please join with me in prayer? Gracious God, bless the bountiful gifts that you have given to us. Let us give out of an abundant spirit, knowing that you have called us to great things through McFarland Memorial United Methodist Church. Let us be filled with your hope knowing that your promise is true, that there is space at the table for all to come, for all to taste of your grace. Amen.
scripture reading for today comes from 1 John uh, chapter 1, verses 5 through 10, and this will be our guiding verse for our yearly focus of living in authentic community. I invite you to hear these words. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh God, you are light and you are love. Give us that light. Fill us with that love. Love for your mission. Love for each other. Light to hear, to see, to perceive what the Spirit is saying to the church out of the Scripture. And we pray that you would open our, our lives to what we hear for the nurture of our lives, for the advance of the mission of Jesus. Amen. This sermon is both a proclamation of the Word of God and part of launching 2021 as the year of authentic community living in the light of God. Of course, we've already begun this year's emphasis with this Soul Reset series that runs through February 14, and today our focus is on community and relationship reset, our frequent need to stop walking in the darkness and return to walking in the light. You know, some creatures on our planet are made to walk in the darkness. They're made for the night. They see well in the dark. Raccoons come to mind. They have unusually large eyes to help them see better in the night, as do night monkeys and opossums. And then there's this strange-looking little primate, the tarsier. They live in the islands of Southeast Asia, and they look like a hybrid of Yoga, Yoda in Star Wars and E.T. by the movie of that same name. They are small animals primates with eyes larger than their brains. They can see so well at night that they can catch the smallest animals in complete darkness. Not so for us humans. Unless we buy expensive night vision goggles, we stumble around, we step on each other or bump into each other in the dark, or we get lost without some kind of light. But it seems that science may remedy that someday, give us the ability to see in the dark. Tian Zhu, a neuroscientist at the University of Science and Technology of China, and his colleagues have developed nanoparticles that convert infrared wavelengths into visible light. So his team attached the nanoparticles to proteins that bind to photoreceptors in the eye, the cells in the eye that convert light into electrical impulses so our brain can help us see. And then they injected them into the eyes of mice. Voila! Mighty mouse. Super mice. They can actually detect and respond to infrared light. They even proved it by giving them mice games, yes, to do in the dark, in the night, and in a small way, this, this breakthrough, is the incarnation of light. Just a hint of what we hear God doing so profoundly in the Scriptures. 
The first words out of the mouth of God as we read the story of creation in Genesis is, let there be light. And all kinds of things began to happen. By that exclamation and its resounding echo over billions of years, God, who is light, fills the galaxies with countless stars and blesses this globe of dust and water with sun and moon, light and day, warmth and life. So then if we jump to the New Testament and the Gospel of John, it opens with echoes of Genesis 1, and we hear that the light of the cosmos, the God who is light, enters the human scene in Jesus, the light of the world, that cannot be conquered. Then in the small biblical book of 1 John, where we are today, we hear that Jesus, who was so human as to be touched by ordinary hands, seen with average eyes, and heard with human ears, speaks this message to those who follow Jesus. God is light, and in God there is no darkness at all, and... If we walk in the light, as God indeed is in the light, we have authentic community with one another. 1 John 1, 5, and 7. It's helpful to know that this book of 1 John was written in part to refute a heresy called Gnosticism that refused to believe that the full light of God could be part and parcel of the material, skin, bones, blood, and breath of a human person. We still struggle with seeing God's light shining in other human Christians, even though we claim that the very Spirit of Jesus lives in them. We struggle with seeing and believing with, with full conviction the very presence of God in the Holy Spirit inhabits the church, our church, this collection of imperfect human beings struggling between sin and righteousness. The promise is that if we walk in the light as God is light and is also in the light, then there are two benefits. One we do have and we will have fellowship, koinonia, a word meaning shared life, deeply connected common life, or authentic community. Secondly, as a part of and also necessary for authentic community, we can and we will experience the frequent and ongoing joy and release that comes with forgiveness. Forgiveness of all the sins that mess up relationships of all kinds. A forgiveness made possible by Jesus, who in faithfulness to God and as a model of the just treatment to all people as required by loving God and loving neighbor, Jesus gave his life so that we can live in the light, in the brightness and the warmth of God's love. So what is authentic community then? And in particular, what is Jesus-defined authentic community? There's much to say and to experience, and we will have in this year a variety of opportunities for us to explore and to experience and to enhance what it means to live in authentic community in the light of God. The book of 1 John is very much about the church as authentic community, and later in this year, we will preach through the book of 1 John and offer studies in that biblical book. So authentic Christian community is a congregation of children of God baptized into the way of Jesus and living intentionally guided by the light of God's love. The writer of 1 John declares both that God is light and that God is love. The meaning is that God's love experienced in Jesus functions as light. It illuminates and defines how we live and act, how we treat each other, how we treat our church, how each of our families relates to and treats our congregation, our loyalty, our participation, our readiness to forgive to heal, to hope, and to forge ahead no matter what. God's focusing love enables us to learn how to live, how to live well with others, how to 
care for others and how to work with others to accomplish the most good. In authentic community, there must be grace, not hostility, honesty, not deceit, and strength to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. It must be a safe place where we and others can share our brokenness, shame, or guilt, or despair, and not be ridiculed or judged and condemned because of it. And we who are participants in authentic community are challenged in this Scripture to practice truth. Do the truth. Practice truth. To practice truth is similar, of course, to walking or living in the light. It is not to pretend flawlessness, but to own up to sins that rupture authentic community, to acknowledge Jesus as the agent of reconciliation. Truth that is practiced is very much the truth of our own brokenness, sinfulness, our tendency to dismiss our errors, rationalize them, claim superiority, and label our opponent as the sinner. We fail to practice the truth when we say, I have no sin. Or in the case of some conflict or breakup, we say, I have not sinned. Deception, self-deception, is the real darkness of believing that I am all light and no darkness, all truth and no error, all right and no wrong. We deceive ourselves when we claim such purity and we even dare to make God a liar. That's what the Scripture says. Because God knows I am a sinner. We are sinners. That we are simultaneously justified and sinners, at the same time faithful and fallen. The third consequence of not practicing truth about ourselves is that we actually push the wisdom and Word of God out of our lives. Verse 10, we just cannot claim that we know the truth better than others if we are not honest that we don't know what we don't know, that we don't know everything, and that, as Paul says, if we don't know, that knowledge balloons our self-pride, but it is love that builds up relationships and authentic community. To practice truth, to perform or behave as people living in the light, also means, of course, that it takes some work. We work diligently and intentionally at good relational skills, effective team-building skills. To some degree, that's a part of this whole emphasis this year. And, of course, being human and broken, we tire of that. We grow weary, and we become careless. It was a warm and sunlit afternoon, bright sunshine streamed through the window of my Ford, Ford Ranger as I made my way north towards Chickasha. I was going to the hospital to visit a church member in Oklahoma City, a 160-mile round trip. Now, I've always been one to work hard and long and early and late and you know, skip sleep and uh, end up being a little bit tired sometimes. And that week was no different. And so the warm sun and the hum of the road and, you know, having just had lunch, I began to get sleepy. And I was fighting it. I thought to myself, just as soon as I get past Chickasha onto I-44, I'll stop at the McDonald's 
and I'll get some iced tea. I don't really remember navigating those last curves going up to the south end of Chickasha until I was awakened by the rumble strips just in time to see a red light and a white truck and to T-bone that truck and hear the collapsing, crashing metal. I can still hear that. After I awakened from just momentary unconsciousness, I got out and went to the truck to see if the two men were okay just as the highway patrol showed up, took over and took things into hand. Fortunately, neither I nor the two of them were severely injured. I was 30-something. I knew how to drive well. I had a good record. I'd been driving since age 14. I was awake when I started, driving in the light, full light, but I dropped off into the darkness of sleep. After waking up, I confessed. I confessed that I had fallen asleep, dipped into darkness. And you know, before that happened, I should have confessed my need for help. I should have, I wish I could have known what I did not know. Admitted to myself how sleepy I was. Stopped and exercised, got out on the side of the road and awakened myself instead of deceiving myself that I could just push on. You know, there are several challenges to living in the light of God in an authentic community of ready and frequent forgiveness. In addition to getting tired of doing the relational work that good community requires, those, there are other challenges, and here's a few of them. They tempt us to walk in the darkness. We live in an individualized society as personal consumers rather than in a culture that champions community in a big and persistent and consistent way. We live in a, an autonomy society rather than a community society. And there's no doubt that the disruption and tension caused by the pandemic and by debate about how to handle and manage the pandemic tempts us to shortchange the work of fostering and maintaining authentic community of radical hospitality. Thirdly, wherever there is racial injustice, and when anyone experiences such injustice, and especially if it happens in the church, then we are walking outside of the clear bright light of God. If we say that we have no such sin among us, then we deceive ourselves. I know that I have growing to do in my own understanding of racial bias, my own understanding of how my sisters and brothers who are of a different Racial, racial or ethnic background and identity experience that. And I know that God's love illuminates us and empowers us and gives us the light in which we can walk, illuminates us and enables us to explore what the reality is together. And another thing that causes us to be tempted to walk in the darkness, our culture and our civic life, even our personal and social living, living falling to what we could call the eclipse of truth because we have these echo chambers or silos of news and media wherein one tribe, one party, one set of pundits take sides like warring tribes using us versus them rhetoric, creating barriers of hostility, curtains of denial, and polarizing one another into adversarial camps 
of significant and serious bedlam mentality. But church, remember the good news, the message of Jesus. God is light, and in God there is no darkness at all. Psalm 139 tells us that even the dark is not dark to God. That's great comfort because we fall into the dangers of walking in the darkness and messing up our joyous, forgiveness-based community and fellowship, our authentic community. But even in the darkness, the light of God's love is there, calling us to account, calling us back into the light. There is no stumble of the church or confusion of direction that can extinguish the light of God's love. There is no night so dark that God is not there calling us to the light. Nell Greenfield Boyce of NPR last September reported that the spacecraft New Horizons, I don't think it's any relation to our New Horizons Sunday school class, New Horizons was, has detected light in the darkness way out in deep space. It was originally designed to explore Pluto, but after whizzing past that dwarf planet in 2015, this intrepid little spacecraft just kept going, and it's now four billion miles from home. That's five times farther from the sun than the Earth is from the sun. Way out there in deep, dark space, it has taken images of what might be called simply blank sky. Scientist Todd Lauer says there's a sprinkling of faint stars, there's a sprinkling of faint galaxies, but it looks random. And so they process the images to remove all known sources of visible light. And once they've sub they had subtracted out the light from stars plus scattered light from the Milky Way and any stray light that might be a result of camera quirks, they were left with light coming in from beyond our own galaxy. And so they went a step further still and subtracted out light that could uh, be attributed to galaxies that they thought would be out there. And it turns out once that was done, there was still plenty of unexplained light, what someone described as, quote, some other source of light that we don't know yet what it is. Of course, even though God owns every speck of light across the cosmos and in all time, God who is light is not detected by spacecraft. We see God in Jesus. And the world is supposed to see the light of God as the love of God so evident in the authentic community life of the church that the world wants to be community with us. We dare not spoil that. We must dare to practice the truth of forgiving love with one another for we all need the joy of authentic community. We all need a place that's safe. We all need that. And the hurting and sinful world needs the McFarlane team as authentic community in Jesus Christ. A team. Jesse Thistle is a Ph.D. candidate and an assistant professor at York University in Toronto, a winner of scholarships and an advocate for the homeless. And in his best-selling memoir, From the Ashes, he tells how he and his, his two brothers lived with their father in abject poverty. Their father was an addict. He was gone all the time, left them alone. They, they learned to steal food at the convenience store and foraged in dumpsters. And eventually they were placed in the home of their paternal grandparents who raised them. But during his late teens and 20s, Jesse struggled with addiction, homelessness, and several brief stints in the jail. Of the 350 pages of that book, 300 of them tell this 
deep, dark story of horrible, raw, and desperate darkness and despair. He was alienated from family, from school, from community. People gave up on him. After so many years of life on the streets, in and out of shelters, of starving and stealing and betrayal and coming to the point of suicide and shame. Finally, after a failed robbery in 2006, he turned himself in to the police. He entered a drug rehabilitation program, a place called Harvest House in Ottawa, Ontario, in Canada, the mission of Harvest House is, quote, to rehabilitate young men who are chemically dependent, to instill in them self-discipline, and to in reintegrate them into society by an interchange brought about by faith in Jesus Christ. When Jesse completed the program at Harvest House, he was on his way to a new life. But before leaving, the, before leaving Harvest House, he sat down with his probation officer, one day, and he said the sun was shining in behind him and carried summer warmth onto my face. The officer commended Jesse for his hard work and his persistent engagement in the recovery program, but admitted to him that he thought he was such a hardcore, hardened, hopeless addict that he would never make it through the program. And when Jesse said, I just chose to live, the officer said, come on now, that's only half of the solution. Don't forget the great team of people behind you, the rehab itself, the addicts who struggled and won victories with you these last 12 months. They held you up and gave you the chance to choose better for yourself. Jesse says, I sat back and thought about it. There was truth in his words. The support of family and love, Harvest House, gave me both. They gave me the opportunity to choose. Let's remember the great team we have and commit ourselves to being the true, authentic community of faith in Christ, living in the light of God. We intend to provide for all of us this year, many opportunities, praying that God will invest them all with the light and the love revealed in Jesus. This year's sermon series and the learning and action options <clears throat> that go with them emerge from our scriptures and out of prayer-centered pursuit of what the Spirit is saying to the church. So during Lent, we'll explore being real like Jesus with text in the Gospel of Luke. After Easter, we'll focus on the holy unity of the church as found in the writings of Paul in June and July, seven weeks in the book of First John, near the end of August, a five-week in-depth look at the great chapter on love in First Corinthians 13. During October, four texts in the book of Acts, all about being all in as God's authentic community. And during Advent, we'll focus on He will bring us goodness and light. On the first chapter of the Gospel of John, taking four Sundays to unpack that wonderful, dense chapter about the coming of Christ, along with, with the traditional Christmas stories of the other Gospels. And also this year, our General Conference team, our Vision Next 100 team, our Centennial team, and our Just Action team will help us explore and act how we can live in the light as authentic community. It takes a community to change lives, change the world, usher in justice that is faithful to the way of Jesus, offer forgiveness that's demonstrated in the death of Jesus, and shout out hope with all the gusto of Easter. We don't do that alone. We dare not cripple community, nor deny the power of community in the light of God. The mission of God requires a strong and harmonious team, a church, our church, 
defined by the way of Jesus and practicing the truth of human humility and Christ-like mutuality, living in the light of God, whose first words continue to bring us hope, let there be light. Let us pray. O God, you are light, and in you there is no darkness. And we see you in Jesus. And we follow in the way of Jesus. And we are forgiven by the work of Jesus. And we are your team. Help us, God, to know ourselves and love each other to the depths. Let there be light. Amen. Church, as you go this week, take care of each other, love each other, love your neighbor, be authentic community for the world and for each other. 
And may the God of all hope so fill you with joy and peace in believing that hope may abound in you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.